since 2012, I've been principal investigator. That's pretty much chief scientist of the technology sector. Um, the governance risk and compliance technology sector. Now it's focusing on risk and financial services. Um, and using technologies like artificial intelligence to, to do so. Uh, and currently, uh, where the centre uh, has transitioned into a smaller, I have 18 researchers we're now focusing directly on uh, artificial intelligence with our major financial institution in the US and also the Bank of England and the Financial Conduct Authority. So just to say that, you know, I'm not a technophobe. Um, I've been working with technology since 1974 when I joined the Department of Coastal Telegraphs. And for the majority of my career there, I was uh, in the satellite and micro microwave radio communications directly uh, for over 12 years. Um, so I'm very familiar with the health risks, at least one side of it, that come with microwave radiation. And that's the thermal effects, the heating effects. All of our safety standards were based around that. And in, in that journey, uh, before I joined academia in 1998, uh, I never came across any literature that indicated that there were non-thermal effects effects on, on biological systems outside heating. And it was in my capacity and my research in the financial industry that I became the chief risk officer of, or shall we say, a household name in the insurance industry. And I had written a paper on the effects of technology in the classroom, just for learning, not, not technology just for the first day. And he said, you know, Tom, it would be really dangerous to children in the classroom from technology with your wife on. So I looked at him and, you know, I thought I was looking at somebody with a tinfoil hat um, because this was unknown to me. But such was his influence that I began to research uh, matters. So, and particularly focusing on uh, 2, 3, 4G, Wi Fi, uh, and what's, what is called and this is the type of radiation we're dealing with here, non-ionizing radiation, uh, as opposed to ionizing radiation. We all know the dangers with ionizing radiation, particularly with cancer. It's quite powerful in terms of uh, what it can do directly to DNA. And what the physicists and the scientists have been relying on um, is general ignorance, basically, number one. And number two, uh, the theory that non-ionizing radiation cannot uh, directly uh, denature DNA and lead to cancers. And that is so. But like everything else in life, there's always a second point, and this has been known for some time. Just a last point here. I train PhDs in the scientific method. I am a scientist. I train scientists in the scientific method. Um, and Sir Karl Popper, one of the, the premier philosophers of science in the 20th century, um, is, is someone who influenced me greatly. So when I began to look at this and take up the challenge uh, of looking into, into this, I applied the scientific method. That means looking at and reading studies. Now, to be sure, a lot of these studies are well outside my area of expertise or dependent on others. Um, so that's that's basically where I'm coming from. Next slide. Um, just some a wee technical overview here, just to, to put things into context, in order to understand better what we're dealing with. Um, with with microwave radiation, which spans all of two, three, four, and on to four G, um, the lower frequencies, which have powered uh, everything. Tele telecommunications world range from sub 900 megahertz uh, to 1.8 gigahertz for, for 2G. And then you can see the frequencies creeping up into the 3D, 3G uh, units, which are still in our phones, by the way. And in some phones, still have 2G units. Uh, and now we have 4G units, fourth generation. And you can see the frequencies there are, uh, at least in the telecom side, up to 2.3 gigahertz between 
around 900 megahertz. Now, you have 4G, and also it's also part of Imagine, which is the service of rigging uh, that uh, you've been using, is, is operates at 3.5 uh, gigahertz band. So, and if you go back up to the top, you'll see Wi-Fi becomes uh, and is now there, which is 3.4 gigahertz uh, and, and 5 gigahertz for Wi-Fi. And those Wi-Fi routers in your homes are transmitting on two radio units, two signals, only one of which you'll probably be using. So you're getting a double whammy in terms of exposure, mm. you know, a double choice. And the other news is that if you're, if you're using a virgin router, you probably have three radio units, two for domestic use and in the home, and one for um, uh, use by virgin customers visiting as a hotspot. So there's a lot more to these. And the person who tipped me off with this was the CRO of the state insurance company, whose wife is electrosensitive. Now, he's a very successful individual professionally, and she's even more successful. And what I brought along tonight is one for everybody in the audience. And it's a little bit early to take one uh, early before you leave. And it's, it's an article written by, well, it's a letter written by Professor Patrice Golan, who's uh, Director of Medicine, Professor of Medicine at the University of California at San Diego. And it's to the Californian Senate. And it synopsizes everything we're going to hear tonight. And there's 340 references, most of which are to scientific papers. Uh, and she details just about every possible non-thermal biological side effect uh, that we now know about for certain, we don't need further science. The theory that non-ionizing radio frequency radiation cannot impact on biological systems has been refuted scientifically. There is no argument about that from a scientific perspective. We can argue about it up, down, and sideways socially, but it's like arguing that, you know, if we drop this, this, this bottle on the floor, that it will somehow float and gravity won't have an effect on it. That's what we're dealing with. Finally, 4G, Wi-Fi, and 5G, all have one thing in common. They use a predictor, and this is a technical term, but it's relevant. They use orthogonal frequency division mul multiplexer in order to uh, transport the information from the beat to the data. But more importantly than that, for biological systems, they use pulsed microwave RFR, and that has been found uh, in labs and also uh, in, in labs in, in cell studies and also in animal studies as being particularly uh, <clears throat> injurious to, 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 to biological life. And uh, biological life is particularly sensitive to this type of of, of non-ionizing microwave radiation at very, very low levels, right, or power densities. So you don't have to be sitting next to a Wi-Fi router or have the phone in your pocket you know, to get the effect. You could be the other side of the room. Next one, please. Uh, you can't see this, so I'm not going to spend too long on it, but I'm sure if Jean can make the slides available, uh, it just puts in a graphical form what you see up here is what 5, 5G is being used for. The lower frequency, 700 megahertz, are going to be used for, for more long wave type signals. The one thing I didn't mention is the higher the, higher the frequency we're talking about, um, the shorter the distance between A and B that can be, or else the higher the power at source has to be to get it from a fixed A to B. What this means, and this is the particular problem with 5G, is that it's like going to be Wi-Fi on steroids. Note from the previous slides that the 5G signals are sitting at 3.0 or 3.8 gigahertz. That's in between the lower band and the higher band we're using for Wi-Fi, domestic Wi-Fi and commercial Wi-Fi today. And that's not insignificant. It's the same type of thing we're dealing with in essence, but there's just going to be more of it. And as Gene pointed out and the video indicated, we're not going to have any choice in that. 
And that is significant. Next slide. Oh yeah, one other thing. Um, you see, you see the band there. There's a higher frequency in 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 five G. It, it transmits around say twenty eight gigahertz, right? That's due to be rolled out next year. And in 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 terms of its application, uh, it's going to be used for the Internet of Things. Now, the biological effects of 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 the very high frequencies above six gigahertz have also been uh, identified and well known. It doesn't penetrate the body at the same level, for example, but it, it's not not the same that it cannot it cannot be injurious. It is, and it's been found out. In actual fact, the US are using uh, 5G type signals for crowd control. They just aim the beams at a high enough power at a crowd, and people feel so uncomfortable in a short period of time, they naturally disperse. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's because the cells in the central nervous system are particularly sensitive to uh, electromagnetic radiation for the simple reason that all of the cells in our body are bioelectric in their function. And that's very important. And we tend to lose, lose sight of that. Next slide, please, Jim. So, Here's something you probably didn't know about. The biological effects of uh, radio frequency radiation have been known since the 30s. Uh, and the people who were leading the way in this were the Soviets, the Russians. Radar was coming into being, but early experiments, and which were conducted in humans as well, because lots of things, when you have a dictatorship in place, it, in this case, a communist dictatorship, um, you know, not only can you experiment in animals, but you have plenty of human subjects also experimenting. Uh, and, and Stalin had millions of them in the 30s. Um, so, so the evidence that was gathered there on through the 40s indicated that there were not only thermal effects, heating effects, but also non-thermal effects. And all of that, that research went, went on and the Soviets began to develop weapon systems to weaponize the scientific the science. So much so that in the 70s and 80s, um, they targeted the US Embassy in Moscow and the diplomats therein and the intelligence people therein and the ambassadors there, right? To levels of low levels of, of high frequency microwave radiation because they knew that the type of effects that Gene was experiencing could be replicated in other subjects. It was a very sneaky, very underhand, but very effective way of putting everybody on edge. Um, so the first time all of this research was catalogued was by Dr. Zori Glasser of the US uh, Naval Medical Research um, Institute in 1971. He finished his bi bibliography in 1976, but by the time it was finished, he catalogued 3,700 scientific studies, a lot of them translated from the original Russian, okay? Which indicated, and th this is available online, you can see it, thermal effects, all of which we know about today, and non-thermal non effects, all of which we certainly know about today. Uh, but, but since then, there have been an equal number, if not more, studies carried out, which have been more rigorous uh, in many ways, and more precise, and which replicate, and that's a very important scientific term, the findings of those original studies. So you can see there from, from there, the thermal effects that Glazer was reporting from the studies was heating of the whole body, brain, eyes, testicles, and sinuses. Um, and as I pointed out, those risks, the risks of, of, of that heating can be mitigated uh, by following safety standards. When I was an engineer uh, in the microwave uh, uh, side of things, shall we say, microwave communications, um, uh, there was a bunch of Italians putting in uh, telecho systems, and uh, they were anecdotally reporting they had been doing the same in Libya, and they had opened up a sideline in sterilizing <coughs> some of the local po male population uh, safely until somebody uh, applied 
too high a power level and um, damage the reproductive organs of, of one of the subjects. Uh, so that particular sideline stopped, but that's thermal effect, that's the heating effect in action. Uh, the non-thermal effects, and this is very important because it was identified very early on. Oxidative process change, what could that be? Well, it, it affects individual cells. And you want about antioxidants, how important they are in terms of human health and cellular health. Well, the flip side of, of antioxidants is the active oxygen species uh, or free radicals. And, and here's the kicker, right? We've long known that radio frequency microwave radiation actually reduces um, um, antioxidants, sorry, and increases the amount of reactive oxygen species. So you have a chemical imbalance in the cell, right? And it does that, as we'll see in a minute, through uh, acting on, on the cell membrane, which is electrosensitive. And even small amounts of external electromagnetic radiation can affect cell operation and trigger a, ca a cascade chemical response, a cascade within the cell that can lead in a number of directions. We'll see that in a minute. Um, so all of this has been replicated in slide two. Look, before I get to the next slide I thought it was coming to, we have a slide in, into the group, right? So why haven't we done, done something about this? It's economics. This has been driven primarily out of research and development, the telecoms industry out of the United States. And um, since the 90s, right, when Motorola was, was still the company, well, was the company it was back then, and pushing cellular out since 1984, when the first mass went out, it, it, scientists were popping up in the States, um, having conducted experiments on, on rats and mice and identified the potential health risks to human beings. And they began to war game um, the, the, the science in effect. That's the official term for Motorola. The industry had realized at that point that it was on a big winner, financially, economically, business models were changing, cellular telecoms, the internet was just roving to my horizon from a commercial point in 1996, right? And in the same year, 1996, 1996 um, the FCC promoted uh, the federal government to institute the, the, the US Telecommunications Act. And that was very important because the industry, who knew and were well aware of the health effects, ill effects, right, of the technology, um, had written into that act that the erection of any antenna could not be challenged on health grounds by anybody, including state governments, including municipalities, including individual system, citizens. So in effect, and, and this is kind of Python-esque in some ways, they deny the existence of any health effects other than healing. And all the safety standards from the 80s and the 90s have been built around that particular lie. Oh, and by the way, if you think we do things better in Europe, forget about it, right? The, the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, which doesn't do any of that, by the way, is a self-appointed NGO who finances it, I don't know, uh, is set up in Germany. Uh, it's a closed club, as you saw. Its members sit on the WHO and on other commissions. And it, its safety standard, right, which was uh, promulgated or released in 1998, has exposure limits for microwave radiation at two watts per kilogram over 10 grams of tissue. Now, what that means is outside of that level, you get into, at any higher level, you're going into heating grounds. So for thermal effects, that's, that's their point, right? That's their minimum point, or sorry, maximum point. The FCC standard, however, is 1.6 watts per kilogram over one gram of tissue, three times as stringent. So the big the question you have to ask yourself, and 
And when I was reading this, I was saying, you know, this doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't make any sense at all, right? So this is what this is what we has been foisted upon us in Europe by a self-appointed group, uh, in effect, and they influence not only the Commission but our governments. But unfortunately, as Alan will probably point out in a minute, we we got an issue there as well. The left hand doesn't know really politically what the right hand is doing. Uh, one department will will issue a health a health and safety standard, for example, in Ireland, protecting against non-thermal effects in the worst workplace, and yet we have kids going to school, and the Department of Education and the Department of Patients will say that Wi-Fi is okay. It isn't. It's not okay for kids. Next slide, please. So, you already heard about the, um, the WHO classifying um, uh, radio frequency radiation as a class two B carcinogen in 2011. The only reason why it's not a class 2A carcinogen or a class 1 carcinogen along with cigarette smoke is simply because our friends in the ICNIRP and the IEEE, the TAME scientists who are in the pay of the industry, fought tooth and nail uh, in the, the WHO. And what we ended up with was a watered down uh, standard. But think of this, class 2B carcinogen. Parents give their kids um, smartphones and uh, two-year-old kids, smartphones and iPads to play with, Wi-Fi enabled, right? And they're hugging these little devices up to that, that close to their body. What does the safety and information, a small thing, say about that? Well, if you read it, if you can see it, or if you can find it, those devices are not supposed to be operated by anybody. And what we're talking about here is a 220-pound US Marine because that's where the initial studies were done, not a 30 pound child, okay? And the safe operating distance for these devices is 20 centimeters from the body or eight inches. I haven't seen one child operate any device, you know, um, in line with the safety, safety standards. But would you give a kid a block of lead to play with or a toy coated with lead paint? Of course you wouldn't, because you know it's toxic. Well, lead is a class 2B carcinogen as well. Would you give a kid a little tin, a jar, or a, a container full of diesel fuel? Of course you wouldn't. Well, they're not going to prefer, it's not going to be ignited. But by the same token, it's also carcinogenic, same as, as Wi-Fi radiation. So it, it doesn't make sense here. Because there are no safe levels that children are concerned. Because they're little frames, are much lighter than ours, and the radiation penetrates a hell of a lot deeper, and their bodies are growing. So since the IERC, which by the way met only last month, and hopefully their findings this time will have, and there is an expectation that their findings this time will will increase to a, at least a class 2A, if not a class 1. And the industry knows this, and they become very skittish because, you know, they're running our runway, really, because since, since, since that decision was made in 2011, and I got this from um, um, one of the scientists operating in this area, and you will see this just really is cancers, right? There have been 15 studies on brain cancers, six studies on, can't pronounce the name, for, I never did it before, meningiomas, vestibular schwannomas, again, are tumors that affect the heart, and it's the same type of cell that leads, uh, of the central ne nervous system, um, um, gland, can parkoid gland cancer, eye cancer, breast cancer, four studies, uh, in the United States, um, females are presented with breast cancers, no genetic history, young women who happen to be carrying their devices while exercising on or near uh, their breasts or in an area in short pockets or whatever. Um, skin cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, thyroid cancer, and multiple cancer studies. There's one study 
It's an epidemiological study uh, carried out in the UK, which had no relation to cell phone um, uh, evidence or anything like that. It just looked at, looked at the increase in cancers of the central nervous system between 1995, very important date, and 2015, 20-year study, okay? And what it found, right, was that some cancer rates declined. But two very important categories of tumors actually rose between two and a half and three times. And these were tumors of the temporal lobe and tumors of the frontal lobe. Now, it doesn't take a genius to make a connection there as to what was happening on a social basis in those 20 years. Now, to be sure, the type of cancers we're talking about, gliomas, are rare, six in every 100,000 people. But if those numbers treble, the incidence rate, right, increases to 18 in 100,000. I saw one industry apologist in the United States publish an article in the New York Times saying, well, what's that? You know, the rates of, of um, uh, prostate cancer and, and, and breast cancer are much higher. And you need to worry about those more than people getting, you know, gliomas. Absolute rubbish. The difference between gliomas and other types of cancers is the, the mortality rate is a hell of a lot higher. Yeah? You have the incidence, the persistence of mortality. So the, the problem there is, is that not a lot of people survive for a long time with cancers of the central nervous system because they tend to grow in places where it's very difficult to get to and you end up paralyzed, or half brain dead, or <clears throat> dead, plain dead. That, those are facts, medical facts. Um, so, the other thing is, uh, there's not a study which demonstrates that the, among young people in the United States, there's been a significant rise in um, non-malignant uh, gliomas, right? No. They're just as bad in many ways as the malignant variety simply because they tend to occur in places which render them inoperable. So this is, this is quite serious. Um, so if, if you look at the research done between 1990 and 2017 by Henry Dodd in Washington, uh, University of Washington in Seattle, you'll see that you know, the effects of health risks such as DNA damage, 64%, neurological effects, 72%, and oxidative stress, 90%. Right, so that's, that's the weight of the scientific evidence in one, one sentence. You can't see this, unfortunately. I thought I'd be dealing with a big screen, but <laughs> hopefully you'll, you'll see it. Um, uh, so uh, I'll just move over here. And maybe take this one here instead. But why can't? The top half of that screen, right, when I was looking at technology, I was saying, right, technology being used by kids for education. The psychological effects, right? You, 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 you've, I've heard it all before. Information overload, cyberbullying, multitasking, distraction, a change in brain chemistry. That's the downside of, of using technology in the classroom for very little benefit. Again, the science has shown that, that there is no benefit to using iPads in the classroom. Uh, from an educational perspective, they'd be better off using pen and paper. But that aside, right? That's that's where I was at when I met my my friend, the the CRO. So he had me look down here. I already know about the physical effects. At least one of them came across research on looking at a screen, an LED screen, has the effect of the particular type of frequency impacts on the eyes, and what it does is it triggers a reduction in melatonin. And a reduction in melatonin is very, is very significant because melatonin regulates the circadian rhythm, which means we don't get a good night's sleep. And people who use devices late at night tend not to get a good night's sleep. You can, however, as my students have learned for me, download little apps that can change the light on your smartphone or iPad or computer 
from a yellow light, which means you avoid you know, melatonin reduction. Can't over, um, can't over negate or mitigate the risks of the other type of effect of melatonin reduction, which happens through another channel. So down here you have microwave radiation, which as I indicated is thermal and non-thermal effects. So if we go down the thermal, if we go not ionizing this right here. Um, so what it ends up with is antioxidant reduction, melatonin being one of the, the chief ones, but not the only one. Um, at the cell membrane, you have these voltage-gated calcium channels, right? These are activated by the electromagnetic magnetic signal, and that starts a chain of, of effects, right? Which, which, from a, a probabilistic perspective, right, um, you don't know where they're going to go. And it'll, 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 you won't have a uniform or consistent effect across individuals. Everybody is unique. Our DNA is pretty much unique. My family, for example, on both my mother and father's side, we don't do cancer. We die from something else, but nobody's got cancer as far as, far as I know. I met this guy the other day, well, he's a colleague in London. He works for Credit Suisse in, uh, in Switzerland. And um, he's into artificial intelligence. He's a, he's a big, bright guy, but he's got type 1 diabetes. The, med the, the medics back in, 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 in Switzerland were confounded because there was no, no history of that on the other side of his family, going back generations. But the one thing they were pinpointing was that when, when he was uh, in his mother's womb, she, early on, she had an extra. So they figured out ionizing radiation <clears throat> somehow change his, his DNA. And he ends up with type, uh, type 1 diabetes. There's another slide on this one, but we'll stay here at the moment for just one more, right? Because we already said oxidative stress is a result of the increase in, in, these, in these free radicals and the in decrease in antioxidants. And oxidative stress can lead to, to many factors. Um, you have lower sperm count. If you, if you rock up to a fertility clinic in India and you're male, and you can't produce. The first thing they'll tell you to do is take a mobile phone in your pocket. That science is pretty strong. <clears throat> so it's been known for quite some time. Immune dysfunction, cardiovascular effects are very significant because if you have a tendency to a heart defect, there's there are movements now to, to ensure that individuals like that won't, don't work in the telecoms industry because exposure to microwave radiation has a deleterious effect on cardiovascular, cardio, cardiovascular function. Miscarriage, more with that in a minute. Uh, cognitive crossing effects, asthma, stress protein, uh, altered brain development, headaches and sleep problems. All of those have been divide, uh, identified by epidemiological studies, by studies in, in the lab with rats, mice, and... Um, and rabbits. Um, down the other side, you've got, or sorry, you've got just up from the free radicals and oxidative stress. The path to DNA denaturing here is pretty straightforward, it's chemical. And it, 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 it's also a random event, may, may or may not happen. Like my father, he smoked when he, since he was 10, he's now 87. He's never got cancer, probably never will. But there's a lot of people who didn't survive. Um, so it's, it's not everybody faces the same risk as what I'm trying to say here. But nevertheless, if that happens, and just at a random, there's a random chemical reaction at a molecular level, and the DNA in a particular cell just changes because it has bonded with a free radical, now you've got a change in your DNA. Now you've set the seeds for cancer, maybe. But the risk is there. Um, studies have indicated also, right? And this is why folks were, and this is incontrovertible, right? Even the telephone industry itself has come up with studies that showed that anybody is using cell phones, heavy users back then that was, um, has a higher risk of 
getting temporal lobe reopens and other cancers of the central nervous system. But lots of studies on animals, mice, who've been deliberately given carcinogens to, to have them develop cancers, right? So you have one group of mice here and another group of mice here, just the control group, no exposure, okay, but given a, carcin a carcinogen. And this group also given a carcinogen, but exposed to microwave radiation and cell phone and Wi-Fi. What they have found is that the mice that are exposed to microwave radiation have a higher mortality rate and a quicker incidence of, 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 of creating tumors and so on and so forth. So it's also pretty much scientifically accepted that this type of non-ionizing radiation is also a core carcinogen. Right, and you can see down this side the types of, of cancers that they can cause. And there's been lots of research done from an epi epidemiological studies on human beings, as well as, as other studies. And you can see down here the neuropsychiatric uh, effects, sleep disturbance, insomnia, headache, depression, depressive system, fatigue, tiredness, obesity, ADHD, cardiovascular effects, and so on, mental hygiene. So, Two weeks ago, I came across this study. It is the US equivalent of VHI. It's Kaiser Permanente. Uh, they're a Californian-based um, um, health provider. And they did some independent research on, on pregnant women. They gave 900 females um, these radio frequency uh, monitors and tracked them throughout their pregnancy. They found that um, women who had the highest exposure were three times more likely to have a miscarriage. They subsequently followed up the children who were born healthy at the end and found that um, the asthma in offspring of heavy users was 2.5 times greater, obesity five times, ADHD nearly three times, and abnormal thyroid function three times. There's a study also done in New York by one of the US's leading gynecologists, right? And he did it in rats because he's concerned about uh, the exposure to uh, children in the womb from their parents' use of cell phones and devices. And what he found with the rats was, and this is a scientific study, was, was the pups who were exposed in utero um, suffered severely severe developmental problems once born. Again, he did a control study. And uh, hyperactivity, poor learning, learning disabilities, and so on. Next slide. So the smoking gun, and I'm going to be very brief on this because my wife is in the back of the room and she's nodding me to, to, to keep on going. She will never give up a shot. Um, so the smoking gun was delivered last year, right, in all of this. The biggest, longest study came from the National Toxicology Program in the US. A 10 year study, $30 million, which um, was peer reviewed for two years, from, from 2016 to 2018. And its core finding was that there was clear evidence. That, by the way, is the highest burden of scientific proof. There was clear evidence, right? Of, of radio frequency, microwave radiation from two and three G signals, right? That would generate heart swanomas in rats. Now, this is cancer of the central nervous system. There was some evidence, which is worn down, but nevertheless significant, of, of gliomas in, in rats. Now, the cry from the industry was, we need more studies. Yeah, when, when you've got a smoking gun, right? I mean, there was, this just replicates dozens of other studies that came up with the same outcome. We've seen all this scientific debate where climate change is concerned, and we're now at a point where gone beyond perhaps the tipping point there. And while scientists have debated whether or not climate change was real, climate change became real. We face the same issue with, with this. Next slide, maybe it's the last. 
and maybe not. <laughs> Risk is threat multiplied by vulnerability multiplied by impact, right? That's the center of the piece, right? So we know we're vulnerable biologically. We know the threat exists. The epidemiological research thus far has shown the impact. But the impact, just remember this, kids haven't really, really been exposed to this for the last 10 years, right? Mm. At an increasing rate. It's an experiment on the young. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you think of the impact, right? Think of this, in days gone by where people are smoking in the room. I'm in communication with one of the Wi-Fi gurus on the planet. He's an Indian. He promotes this. And yet, even he is concerned about the saturation from, from Wi-Fi devices um, in the environment. And he's written to the FCC because the effects are cumulative. The effects, you know, the more smokers you have in a room, the smokier the room is. Okay? And here's a classroom down here. It's not just a simple, you know, eight inches from, from, the, from, from the laptop. The, the power density at any point in that room changes depending on several factors. How closely grouped those devices are, are together, how near you are to the Wi-Fi router, and so on. Next to, and final slide. And it is. Um, so there's a set of guidelines here, right? We can't turn back the clock. We can't put, you know, the genie or the, the back into the bottle or close Pandora's box. It's out there, right? But we have to take a very sensible approach to the use of these technologies. A risk-informed Approach. We have to mitigate the risks and live with the residual risk. But the one category of individual, or maybe two categories, because it begins in the room, that have to be protected absolutely are children. And it is for that reason that I would, would urge the group to, to kind of think and save, to resist and question the imposition of, uh, of 5G, to resist and question the, the imposition of Wi-Fi in the schools. It's not required for education purposes. And it's deployed very badly from a technical perspective. Um, and most homes carry excessive Wi-Fi risks as well because people don't know the risk they're dealing with and they can't mitigate it if they don't know about it. So that message has to go out. I tend to go